Hello and welcome to Chapter 6, the Human Body Lecture of the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured 12th edition. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will be able to describe and apply in context the body planes, topographic anatomy, and the atomic position. You will be able to identify basic autotomic structures and related functions and describe each body system, discussing the roles of the structures within these systems and the interaction of body systems in maintaining a life support chain. You will be able to discuss possible consequences of illness and injury of these structures and systems on proper functioning of the body. Okay, so a working knowledge of anatomy is important. Within anatomy, there's terminology. So let's talk about uh, anatomy, and that's a field of study that focuses on the physical structure of a body and its systems. Then there's physiology. So physiology examines the normal functions and actions and activities of the body and its systems. Then there's pathophysiology. Pathophysiology is the study of the functional changes that accompany a particular disease or syndrome. All right, so some topographic anatomy. Uh, this applies to the body in the autotomic position so that everyone is referring to the body in the same way. So the autotomic position is the body stands facing you, arms to the side, and palms forward. Let's talk about some planes of the body. So imaginary straight lines that divide the body are body planes. And there are three main areas, depending on how the body is divided. Okay, so you have the corneal, and that's the frontal plane. It divides the body's front and back. You have the sagittal. It's a lateral plane, and that divides the body's left and right side. You have a mid-sagittal. It's a midline, and it's a special type of sagittal plane where the body is cut in half, leaning, leaving equal left and right halves. Then you have a transaxial plane, and that divides the body's top and bottom. Here's a great slide, and it shows the different planes of the body as divided. Okay, so from cells to systems, and uh, let's talk all the way through it. So cells are the foundation of the human body. Cells that share a common function form tissue, and groups of tissues that perform a similar or interrelated jobs form organs, and then organs with similar functions work together to compromise a body system. Next, we're going to talk about all those body systems, okay? So first, though, we're going to talk about the skeletal system, and we're going to talk about the anatomy of it. Next, we'll talk about the physiology, okay? So the skeletal system, what does it do? It, it gives us our recognizable human form and protects vital internal organs. It's made up of 206 bones, and you have two major divisions. You have an axial skeleton, and that is basically the, um, the appendix area, the, the uh, middle area of the body. And then you have the appendicular, and that comprises all the extremities, okay? So the axial, it forms the longitudinal axis of the body from the skull down to the coccyx. And it includes the skull, facial bones, thoracic caved, and vertebrae column. And then you have the appendicular, like I said, this comprises of the upper and lower extremities and the points at which they connect to the axial skeleton. The pelvis includes portions of both the axial and appendicular skeletons. Okay, so we talked about how the skeletal system, it's, it's made of bones, but it's also made of joints. And joints occur wherever bones come in contact. Ligaments are fibrous tissues that connect bone to bone, and it helps to stabilize the joint. Then you have cartilage, and that's that semi-rigid and flexible tissue that covers and cushions the ends of the bones. Okay. You also have tendons, and those attach bone to muscle. You have symphysis, which are joints where only slight movement is possible. Okay. Then you have the, the bone ends of the joint and are held together by fibrous sacs called a joint capsule. You have articular cartilage, and this allows the bones of the ends of the bones to glide easily. You have synovial membranes, and that is the inner lining of a joint capsule. It produces synovial fluid, 
which allows the bone ends to glide over each other. All right, so types of joints, we have ball and socket. This allows rotation and bending. And then we have the hinge joint, and that motion is restricted to flexation and extension, so bending and straightening. And this is a great slide. It shows uh, the ball and socket and the hinge joint. So you see the shoulder is an example of that ball and socket, and then the um, elbow and knee are hinge. Okay, so the first um, part of the skeleton we're going to talk about the skeletal system is the axial skeleton. And if you remember what I said, it's a, the skull all the way down to the coccyx, so it's the center area of the body. And this consists of 28 bones. First, we're going to talk about the skull. So it consists of 28 bones divided into three groups. You have the cranium, facial bones, and then three small bones in the ear. So the first one, the cranium. The cranium can be even broken down even further, and that uh, protects the brain, and it consists of four bones, okay? So you have the occipit. That's that posterior portion. It's the flat posterior portion. Then you have the temporal bones. Those are the lateral portions. And then you have the parietal bones. These are located near, between the temporal and the occipit. And then the frontal, which is the forehead, okay? You also have also have facial bones and that consists of 14 different facial bones um, it's the upper movable jaw bone and that's the maxilla and then you have the cheekbones those are the zygmas on uh, the lower movable portion of the jaw that's the mandible then you have the orbits those are eye sockets uh, and they include the zygmas maxilla and the frontal bones of the cranium and then you have very short bones that form the bridge of the nose the nasal bones all right, so from the skull down to the axial skeleton, and this is continuing on the axial skeleton, okay? So this consists of the spinal column, consists of 33 vertebrae, and it's divided in the five second sections. Uh, each section are numbered from top to bottom. So let's talk about this. Uh, we have the cervical spine, and that's that neck area. And uh, I like to say we, uh, the numbers of the different areas are um, the, the times that we eat uh, during the day. Okay, so the cervical spine is that neck area. I say we eat at 7 a.m. If we get up early, we're eating at 7, okay? 7 a.m. So there's seven vertebrae in that cervical spine. Then you have the thoracic uh, spine uh, that consists of 12 vertebrae. So we're going to eat lunch at noon. So we got 12 vertebrae. Then we have the lumbar spine, and that's that lower back area. And we, uh, we eat dinner at 5. And then maybe we have a 9 o'clock snack, all right? So 9 p.m. snack, and that's the sacrum. That's the back wall of the pelvis. It consists of five fused vertebrae. And the, the um, sacrum and the coccyx, uh, which is the tailbone, that is uh, four. And I put those together to do nine because those are fused, right? So fused, um, you have the coccyx that's fused. Okay. Uh, the vertebrae are connected by ligaments and are protected by the intervertebral discs. All right, so when we talk about the axial skeleton, we need to talk about the thorax. And the thorax is formed by the 12 thoracic vertebrae. At noon, we're eaten, and they form 12 ribs. And so those, uh, the thorax is formed onto that thoracic area, and um, you could remember it by the name. But there's a thoracic cavity. And this thoracic cavity contains very important stuff, okay? So we, um, inside the, the ribs, it, it basically is the protection for the heart, lungs, esophagus, and great vessels, okay? Um, it is the midline of the chest and um, is the sternum, which is made up by the mandibrum body and the xiphoid process. All right. And then you have the appendicular skeleton. So this is all the appendices, I say. It's the arms, legs, and their connection points, and the pelvis. And it includes joints, upper extremity, pelvis, and the lower extremity. Okay. The appendicular skeleton in the upper extremities extend from the pectoral girdle um, to the fingertips. Here's a real good photo of that. It's a shoulder girdle where the uh, clavicle, scapula, and humerus all come together right there. And that's that shoulder girdle. 
And then you have the arms, you have the humerus, and that's a supporting bone, then the forearms, and that consists of the radius and ulna. Then the radius lies on the lateral aspect or the thumb side, and that's where you take that radial pulse. Then you have the ulna, the ulna is on the medial or the little finger side. Okay. Then once you get into the wrist, super easy to remember, um, you have modified ball and socket, and uh, you could uh, figure that out by how you could move your your wrist and it's formed by the ends of the radius and ulna and the wrist bones. Okay. Then you have five metacarpals and they extend to uh, from the carpals and make up the hand and the fingers are composed of phalanges. Okay. So metacarpals, uh, phalanges, so carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. All right, the pelvic girdle, and that consists of two large hip bones, um, the sacrum and the coccyx, and each coxa is formed and fused by uh, the IIP, is what I usually say, the ilium, ischium, and pubis. pubis. All right, the pubic symphysis is cartilage that joins the left and right pubic bones and limits movement between the bones. Then moving down to the lower extremities, you have the femur. And the femur is the longest and one of the strongest bones in the body. And the femoral head connects to the pelvic girdle by a ball and socket joint. Okay. Then you have the greater and lesser trochanters, and they serve as anchor points for the major muscles of the thigh. The knee is a hinge joint and it connects the femur to the bones of the lower leg. And the lower leg bones are the tibia and fibia. All right, then you have the ankle and foot. The foot comprises of the tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. So instead of the hand, the hands are carpals, metacarpals. Uh, the foot, you have the tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. So easy way to remember that. Then you have the distal ends of the tibia and the fibia. They articulate um, with the talus and they form the ankle. All right. Here's a, a good photo of the foot, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So the foot, they contain seven talus bones. All right, so there's seven, and um, here we go. And the talus and the uh, calculus, calcanus, are the largest bones, and the, the talus joint with the distal tibia and fibia to form the ankle joint. And um, there's five metatarsal bones form the substance of the foot. So the plantar surface or the bottom of the foot, and then you have the dorsum, the top of the foot, and you have five toes formed by 14 phalanges, two phalanges in the big toe, and three phalanges in each of the smaller toes. All right, so the skeletal systems physiology. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and how that works. So the skeletal system gives the body its shape. It protects fragile organs, allows for movement, stores calciums, and helps create blood cells. And the musculoskeletal system provides form, upright posture, movement, protection, and vital internal organs. Okay, so let's talk about this. There's three types of muscular or of muscles, and that's the skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Okay, so the skeletal system attaches to the bones of the skeleton and forms the major muscle mass of the body. And this is known as voluntary muscle because it's under direct voluntary control of the brain. So the skeletal muscle, you, you're able to pick stuff up and put stuff down. That's how I think of it, okay? Um, the smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, though, they do not require constant thought. They are said to be involuntary, all right? So smooth muscle is found within the blood vessels and intestines. And cardiac muscle, well, where is that found? You got it. That's found in the heart. So this figure shows the major muscles of the human body. So let's talk a little bit about the muscular skeletal system and what it does. So it contracts, uh, contractation and relaxation of the skeletal system make it possible to move and manipulate the environment. A byproduct of the skeletal system is heat. And when you get cold, you shiver. That's an involuntary shake of the muscles to produce heat. Another function of muscles is to protect the structures under them. 
All right, so moving right through the systems, now we're already into the respiratory system. So let's talk about the anatomy. You have the respiratory system, and it's responsible for breathing or respiration and exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide within the lungs. The respiratory system is divided into the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. So the upper system is consists of the nose, mouth, tongue, jaw, and larynx. And so that's the dividing spot, the larynx, don't forget that. And that divides the upper and lower, it is in the upper. All right. Um, and then we're still talking about the upper, we have the pharynx, the trachea, and the epiglottis. Okay, then you have the lower airway. So you have the thyroid cartilage, that's the Adam's apple, um, that uh, forms the anterior part of the larynx. And then you have the cricoid cartilage, you have the cricoid thyroid membrane, then you have the trachea below the cricoid cartilage, and the trachea ends at the corona. And it divides into the right and left main stem bronchi, which enter the lungs and branch into even, even smaller airways. At the lungs, you have two lungs. They're held into place by the trachea, and then the artery and veins, and you have pulmonary ligaments, okay? So each lung is divided into two, into lobes. The right one has three. So the right lung has three, an upper, middle, and lower. And then the left has two, just an upper and lower. Each lung is divided into lobes, which I just talked about, but within the lobes are bronchi and bronchioli, and um, that which end at the alveoli. Okay, so the alveoli, that's where the magic happens. That's, uh, that's the gas exchange, and where what exchanges is oxygen and carbon dioxide. All right, so let's talk about some mechanisms that allow us to breathe. Okay, so you have the pleura. So there's a visceral pleura. And the visceral pleura, that covers the lungs. Then you have the parenteal pleura, and that lies the chest wall, okay? So a thin layer of fluid uh, helps them uh, facilitate movement of the lungs, okay? And then you have the pleural space, and that is a potential space between two pleura, between the two pleura, okay? And this is a good figure. It shows the structure of the lungs and what we just talked about. So a little bit more, we're gonna talk about the muscles of breathing. So the diaphragm is a primary muscle of breathing. This contains voluntary and involuntary muscle, okay? So it has cervical muscles, intercostal muscles, abdominal muscles, and pectoral muscles also help us aid in breathing. The big one though is the diaphragm. So let's talk about inhalation. When we inhale, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract. And this makes a large space in that thoracic cage. And because there is that large space in that cage, the thoracic cavity decreases and the lungs fill. So negative pressure ventilation. Because the diaphragm does contract, this is an active part of the respiratory cycle. We say that it takes energy to do, okay? With exhalation though, it's passive. And it's a passive portion and the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles basically relax. And when that happens, the, the thoracic cavity returns to its normal shape and volume and air just flows out. It's passive, no energy involved. All right, so let's talk about the physiology of the respiratory system. So the respiratory system's function is to provide the body with oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide. Ventilation and respiration are two separate yet interdependent functions of the respiratory system, okay? So ventilation is the movement of air between the lungs and the environment. So think about when you ventilate somebody with a bag valve mask, that's basically what you're doing. And then respiration, that of course is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli and in the tissues of the body. So let's talk about respiration. Oxygen and carbon dioxide move across the membrane between the capillaries and the alveoli via diffusion. So what is diffusion, you say? Diffusion is the passive process in which molecules move from one area with a higher concentration of that molecule to an area of a lower concentration. Okay, so when we talk about breathing, there is a chemical control for it. 
what happens is the brainstem controls breathing by monitoring levels of carbon dioxide in the blood and spinal fluid. All right. So breathing is automatically controlled in the level of carbon dioxide or oxygen in the arterial blood and if it's too high or too low. So breathing occurs as a result of buildup of carbon dioxide in the cerebral spinal fluid, which causes the pH to decrease. All right, so it sounds like a lot, but it's not. The medulla oblongata is stimulated by the phrenic nerve, and so this phrenic nerve causes the diaphragm to contract. And the primary reason for breathing is to lower carbon dioxide levels next to um, levels not to increase the oxygen levels. So we want to lower the carbon dioxide levels, not increase the oxygen. However, when somebody has an increased level of carbon dioxide built up in their system for years, they switch to a different drive. Okay, so these are the chronic obstructive pulmonary patients. They switch to what's called a hypoxic drive. This is known as a backup system to control respiration. The stimulus to breathe is from low oxygen levels. Okay, that's the hypoxic drive. The nervous system controls the breathing. And so when, when, it, when we talk about that, we already mentioned the medulla oblongata, and that is the uh, responsible for initially uh, initiating the ventilation cycle. It's a primarily stimulated by high carbon dioxide levels, just what we said, and it helps control the rhythm of breathing. The initial inspiration, it sets the base pattern for respiration and sends a signal to the diaphragm via the phrenic nerve, okay? Then we have the pons. The pons has two areas which help the respirations during an emotional and physiological uh, stress, okay? Physical stress. This helps change the depth of inspiration, expiration, or it could change both. Okay, so we let's talk about ventilation. There's a couple different um, uh, keywords that you should know. Um, and the first one is going to be tidal volume. And so that's the amount of air that is moved in and out of the lung with a single breath. Okay, so generally about 500 milliliters in an adult. It's the inspiratory reserve volume is the deepest breath you can take after a normal breath. Then you have the expiratory reserve volume, and that's the maximum amount of air that you can forcefully breathe out after a normal breath. Then you have residual volume. So you have a residual amount of, uh, of gas remaining in the lungs after uh, exhalation. Then there's some dead space. And this is the portion of the respiratory system that has no alveoli and little to no gas exchange. All right, now that you've heard all of those definitions, next let's talk about minute volume. Okay, so minute volume. Minute volume is basically used to assess the adequacy of ventilation. And so what you do is the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs in one minute. So the minute volume is equal to the respiratory rate times the tidal volume, okay? So let's talk about some characteristics. So we wanna have a normal rate and depth, normal tidal volume, right? So we wanna have a regular rhythm or pattern of inhalation and exhalation. We also wanna have clear audible breath sounds or both on both sides of the chest. So bilateral, clear, audible breath sounds. We want to have regular rise and fall movement on both sides of the chest, and we want to have movement of the abdomen. Inadequate breathing patterns, though, you could have labored breathing, you could be breathing slower than 12 a minute or more than 20 a minute, and some additional signs is you could have muscle retractions above the clavicles, between the ribs, or below the rib cage. Somebody could look pale or have cyanotic skin, they could be cool, damp skin, or in that tripod position. Okay. All right. So we talked about the respiratory system. Now we're going to talk about the circulatory system next. And this is a great system. The circulatory system, it's also known as the cardiovascular system and is a complex arrangement of connected tubes. Okay. So we have the ar arteries, ar arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. There are two circuits. 
<clears throat> so we have a systemic circulation, which is the oxygen-rich blood from the left ventricle through the body and back to the right atrium. And then we have a pulmonary uh, circulatory system, and that carries oxygen-poor blood from the right ventricle through the lungs and back to the left atrium. And this figure shows the circulatory system. Okay, so this is a, a good, uh, good photo. And when you see the blue blood, that's deoxygenated blood. When you see red, that's oxygenated, the right side versus the left side. Okay, we can't talk about the circulatory system unless you talk about the heart. So that's what we're going to do next. And this is an involuntary muscle. It's made of cardiac muscle, and that cardiac muscle is called myocardium. And thank goodness it's involuntary. That means we don't have to think about it to, to beat, right? And it works on basically with two paired pumps. Each side is divided into the left side of the muscle, and that is high pressure on that left side. And then you have the right side, and that is a thinner muscle, and that's a low pressure pump. The top of the heart is called the atrium, and the bottom chambers are the ventricles. So to circulate, the heart receives its blood from the aorta via the coronary arteries, and the right side of the heart receives deoxygenated blood from the veins of the body. The oxygenated blood returns from the lungs through the pulmonary veins into the left side of the heart and is pumped into the aorta and then to the arteries of the body. Valves guide the blood, uh, the path of the blood through the heart. Okay, this is a great slide. It shows um, the right and left sides of the heart. All right, so you have a normal heartbeat, and we want all the heartbeats to be normal, and a normal rate is it's between 60 to 100 beats. And then you have the stroke volume. You'll see it written SV. That's the amount of blood uh, moved by one beat. Then you have the cardiac output. That's CO, the amount of blood moved in one minute. So the cardiac output equals the heart rate times the stroke volume. That's how you get the cardiac output. All right. So a heart, a heart has to have this electrical conduction in order for it to beat. And that network of specialized tissue is, um, that is capable of initiating and conducting electrical current runs through the heart. So the electrical impulses begin high in the atria at the sinoatrial node, and this, then they travel through the atrioventricular node and to the bundle of his, and then move through the Purkinje fibers to the ventricles. This movement produces a smooth flow of electricity, it's producing a coordinating pump action. And if injured, that electrical system, the heart will not beat properly. Okay, so then let's move to the arteries. The arteries, they're high pressure. If you cut an artery, it's going to spurt, and they carry blood from the heart to the body tissues. This is oxygenated blood. Um, the big main one is the aorta. That's the biggest tube. It's the main artery, and it leaves that left side of the heart, and it carries fresh oxygenated blood to the body. It has many branches, and these branches supply vital organs, okay? And so those are the vital organs you can see on the slide. Um, you have the uh, coronary arteries, the carotid, hepatic, renal, and mesenteric arteries. Okay? And then you have the pulmonary arteries, and these, uh, the pulmonary artery is the only deoxygenated arteries um, in the body other than in the um, neonatal or, um, area. So the pulmonary arteries, it originates at the right ventricle, then it carries oxygen-poor blood uh, back to the lungs. Okay, so pulmonary arteries are deoxygenated. Then you have arteries, uh, they branch into smarter, smaller arteries, and then finally into arterioles. And when the arterioles branch into a series of increasingly smaller vessels until they connect to a vast network of capillaries, and that is where the CO2 exchange occurs. All right, your pulse is created by the forceful pumping of blood out of the left ventricle into those major arteries. You could palpate most easily at the neck, wrist, and groin. And this is gonna show the major arteries of the body, this slide. All right, so then we got down to the capillaries at the very tiny level. 
and that's those tiny little blood vessels that connect arteries to venules. Oxygen and nutrients pass from the blood cells and plasma into capillaries to individual tissue cells through a thin, very thin walls of capillaries. Capillaries allow blood to move into them one cell at a time. All right, so we've gotten our oxygen into our cells. Now let's talk about returning from our cells. And we have to talk about the veins. These are the blue areas. They're oxygen depleted blood and it's going back to the heart, okay? So they have thinner walls and arteries and are generally larger in diameter. You have major veins, and these major veins are the superior vena cava. They carry blood returning from the heart, neck, shoulders, and upper extremities. Then you have the inferior. So, of course, just how it sounds, it carries blood from the abdomen, pelvis, and lower extremities. All right? So you have systemic vascular resistance, and the resistance to blood flow within the blood vessels, uh, except the pulmonary vessels, of course. Okay? All right, so we have to talk about the spleen when we talk about the circulatory system. It's a solid organ. It's located under the rib cage on that left upper portion of the abdomen. It filters worn out blood cells, foreign substances, and bacteria out of the blood. It's highly vascular and is particularly susceptible to injury from blood trauma. So, and then we have to talk about the blood composition, of course, when we're talking about the circulatory system. So it has four major things composed of plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Okay. So the plasma, that's that liquid portion of the blood. It contains water, proteins, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, of course, and then some nutrients. Then you have the red blood cells. These are the erythrocytes. They contain hemoglobin, and those are the little uber drivers for the oxygen. Then you have the white blood cells. These are leukocytes, and they play a role in the body's immune system defense, and they fight the infection. Those are the fighters. And then the platelets, of course, those are the partiers. They all want to hang out together. The uh, initial formation of blood clots. All right. So we talked about the circulatory system. So let's talk about the physiology of it. The, it uh, the blood pressure, so we'll talk about that's the pressure the blood exerts against the walls of those arteries. When you have the systole, that's when the left ventricle of the heart contracts. It pumps blood from the ventricles into the aorta. Then you have the diastole, that's when the muscle of the ventricle relaxes, the ventricle fills with blood. So systolic, diastolic, taking the blood pressure forceful ejection of blood from the left ventricle into the aorta is transmitted through the arteries as a pulsatile pressure wave. And this can be measured with a blood pressure cuff, a systolic blood pressure, that's the high wave it, as the heart is contracting, and the diastolic, that's the low point as it's relaxing. It's expressed in millimeters of mercury. All right, normal circulation in adults. It can be automatically adjusted and controlled. And the perfusion, that's the circulation of blood in an organ or tissue in adequate amounts to meet the current needs of the cells. Okay, so hypoperfusion, that is an inadequate blood supply to the organs, tissues, and cells. And we call this shock. So hyperperfusion is also known as shock. Inadequate circulation in adults. So we said that it can be adjusted. The system can adjust to a small amount of blood loss. So what happens is the vessels are gonna constrict, the tubes of the body or the vessels are gonna constrict and the heart is gonna pump faster. So with large blood loss though, the adjustment might fail and the patient is gonna go into shock. And what happens is the mean arterial pressure can help detect shock. All right, so the average arterial pressure during systole and diastole, and basically it's the um, MAP, so the mean arterial pressure equals the cardiac output times the SVR. All right, so functions of the blood. Let's talk a little bit about that. And function, blood fights, it fights infection. It transports oxygen, transport carbon dioxide. It controls pH. It transports waste and nutrients. And it also um, coagulates. 
Okay, so we've moved from the circulatory system. Now we're in the nervous system. Um, oh, actually, we're going to talk about the, the nervous system control of the cardiovascular system, and then we'll move into the nervous system. So let's talk about its control on the cardiovascular system. All right, so we have the sympathetic nervous system, and uh, basically two types. We have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic, but the sympathetic is that fight or flight response. And what happens is it sends commands to these adrenal glands that we have. And uh, when it sends that signal, epi and norepi are secreted, and it stimulates heart and must and the blood vessels, okay? So the nervous system controls um, that fight or flight response. So the sympathetic nervous system, so the heart and blood vessels have these things called alpha adrenergic receptors and beta adrenergic receptors. And the adrenergic, adrenergic means uh, related to the adrenal glands where the epi and norepi are made. The alpha adrenergic receptors are found in blood vessels. And so when they're stimulated, blood vessels contract. But the beta, the beta adrenergic receptors are found in the heart and lungs. When beta-1 receptors are stimulated, the heart rate and force of contraction increase. And when beta-2 receptors are stimulated, the bronchi of the lungs dilate. Okay, so parasympathetic nervous system, um, that is basically, I think, of paradise. And this causes the heart rate to slow and beat more weakly. Okay, so parasympathetic, almost the exact opposite of what the uh, sympathetic nervous system does. So the sympathetic and parasympathetic usually are nervous systems and they balance each other. All right, so baroreceptors sense pressure in the blood vessels. It's found in the a aorta and carotid bodies. And stimulation, it causes stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system to adjust blood pressure. So it's a great tie-in to the nervous system, and that's the next system we're going to talk about next. And you have anatomy and physiology, and of course we'll talk about that the nervous system is perhaps the most complex organ system in the body, all right? So just like the um, skeletal system divided into two aspects, so is the um, nervous system and it's it's divided into two main portions we have the central nervous system and you'll see it written cns and that is the brain and the spinal cord almost just like the um the skeletal system right and then you have the peripheral nervous system and that's all the nerves outside that brain and spinal cord the peripheral nervous system is divided again into the somatic nervous system and that regulates voluntary control Sounds a lot like muscles, right? So voluntary control, pick stuff up, put stuff down. Then you have the autonomic nervous system, and that controls functions that occur automatically. So what are those? All right, so that's all the tubes in the body, the smooth muscle, and the cardiac, right? All right, so let's talk about this nervous system. The nervous system controls the brain. There's three different parts that we're going to divide the brain into, right? So the cerebrum, and that's the largest part of the brain. Its surface is made up of neurons. It's responsible for higher brain function, and it can be divided into halves or hemispheres. Each hemisphere has four lobes. You have the frontal, the parietal, occipital, occipital and the temporal. And uh, if you understand uh, or if you remember, those sound very familiar. It almost sounds just like the bones of the skull, right? So you have the frontal, um, except for these are lobes. So frontal lobe, that's personality, judgment, planning, problem solving, concentration, and self-awareness. You have the parental uh, lobe, that is um, recognition. And so you have the occipital lobe that deals with vision. And then the temporal lobe, that's taste, hearing, and the ability to understand words. Then you have a long, long word, the cerebellum. And uh, it's actually the tiniest part of the brain. And that controls balance, muscle coordination, and posture. That's how I think about it. Then we have the brainstem. Oh boy, the brainstem is very important. It controls body functions necessary for life. And this includes cardiac and respiratory functions and it also regulation of consciousness. It's comprised of the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. We have the reticular activating system and this regulates consciousness. All right, and also in the central nervous system, we can't forget about the cerebral fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid. You'll see this written as CSF. 
And what that does is it filters out impurities and toxins. It also cushions the brain and the spinal cord. All right. So circulation in the head, we have oxygenated blood is supplied via the uh, carotid arteries. And then deoxygenated blood is drained from the head via the internal and external jugular veins. All right, then the spinal cord. So let's talk about that. That's an extension of that brain stem. It leaves the skull via the forum magnum, and it's encased within the vertebral column. It uh, ends at the level of the second lumbar vertebrae, and um, the primary function is to transmit messages between the brain and the spinal cord. And then we have the peripheral nervous system, okay? So we have that central nervous system. Now we have the peripheral, and it's divided into two parts, just like we talked about earlier, the voluntary and involuntary. We have the somatic nervous system. This transmits signals from the brain to the voluntary muscles, okay? And then it allows for activities such as walking, talking, and writing. Then we have the autonomic nervous system. These are involuntary. And we talked about that. That's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Remember the fight or flight or the um, paradise system, the relax, chill. Okay, so within this peripheral nervous system, we have two types of nerves. We have sensory nerves and motor nerves. So the sensory nerves, they carry info um, from the body to the CNS, to the central nervous system. And then we have motor nerves. And those motor nerves carry information from the brain to the muscles. Okay, and now we're going to go on to the skin system or the intermegatory system. Okay, and there are two layers of the skin. There's the epidermis and the dermis. So the epidermis is the superficial layer, and that's a, it, its function is uh, to seal it, make it watertight. It's almost like a protective covering. It's composed of layers, and you have the dermal layer, uh, stratum, corneal layer, then the skin cells are constantly being replaced in this uh, epidermis, okay? Then you have the dermis, it's deeper, and uh, this contains special structures of the skin, the sweat glands, the um, sebaceous glands, hair follicles, blood vessels, and mucous membrane. Below the skin lies the subcutaneous tissue, and that's a layer of fat that serves as an um, ice, uh, insulator and as an energy reservoir. This is a great slide. It shows a really good picture of those layers, the epidermis, dermis, and the subcutaneous. All right, so the intermegatory system, the physiology. So we're going to talk about um, the skin is the largest single organ on the body, and it has three major functions. What it does is it protects the body from the environment, it regulates body temperature, and then it transmits information from the environment to the brain. Okay. All right, so we're going to move right in. We're going to go into the digestive system. And uh, what does it do? So this is also called the gastrointestinal system. And the components of it are the abdomen and organs and the vascular structures. So the abdomen contains major organs of the digestion and excretion. And quadrants are easily the easiest way to identify these areas, okay? And so you're going to uh, divide it into four quadrants. You have the upper right quadrant. In the upper right quadrant, it contains the liver, gallbladder, and a portion of the colon. And then the upper left, that contains the stomach, spleen, and the portion of the colon. And then the right lower, that contains a portion of uh, the large intestines. Then the lower left, that contains the descending uh, and sphyg sigmoid portions of the colon. Okay. The small intestines, pancreas, large intestines, and urinary bladder lie in more than one quadrant. The kidneys and pancreas lie behind the abdominal cavity, and we say that that is retroperitoneal. So the kidneys and pancreas are retro behind the peritoneal, the abdominal cavity. This is a great slide. It shows those quadrants, the four quadrants of the abdomen. Okay, so we have to talk about the digestive system, though. Um, even though we've already talked about some of the organs, let's start with the beginning, and that's the mouth. And that consists of cheeks, lips, gums, teeth, and tongue, the hard palate and soft palate, the salivatory glands, and uh, uh, two sets. So on each side of the mouth and in the front and each, 
each year, you have saliva is approximately 98% water and 2% mucus and salt and organic compounds. From the mouth, we move into the oral pharynx, and this is a, a tube structure that extends from the back of the mouth to the esophagus and trachea. Then you have the esophagus, and the esophagus is the tube. It's about 10 inches, and it extends from the end of the pharynx to the stomach. The muscles of the walls of the esophagus propel food down into the stomach. Then you have the stomach, it's a hollow organ, and that left upper quadrant, it receives food, stores it, and produces, uh, provides for movement of the food into the bowel. You have the pancreas, which is retroperitoneal. It is a flat, solid organ that lies below and behind the liver and stomach. There are two portions. We have an exocrine and an endocrine. So what the exocrine does is that secretes pancreatic juice, and then you have the endocrine, and that produces insulin and, and glucagon. Next you have the liver. The liver is a large solid organ immediately behind the diaphragm in the right upper quadrant. It extends into the left upper quadrant as well though because it's so big. The liver has many functions and um, so it filters out harmful substances. It forms the factors needed for blood clotting and plasma production. It stores sugar and starch for immediate use by the body for energy. Then it has bile ducts. So bile ducts connect the liver to the intestine. And this uh, carries bile from the liver to the gallbladder where bile is stored. All right. You have the small intestines and the large intestines. We'll talk about those. So the small ones are major hollow organs of the abdomen. They produce enzymes and mucus to aid in digestive, digestion. And then you have the large intestine. And the, it's the major hollow organ consisting of the sesum, the colon, and the rectum. And the major function of the colon is to observe the final 5 to 10% of digested food and water from the intestines and to form solid stool. All right. Then we have the appendix. That's a 3 to 4 inch long tube that opens into um, the first part of the intestines. It's in the right lower abdomen. Okay. So it may become easily obstructive and it inflamed or infected, and that's appendicitis. All right, and then finally we have the rectum. It's a large hollow organ adapted to hold um, quantities of feces until it's expelled. At uh, its terminal end is the anus. Sphincters control the escape of gases, liquids, and solids from that digestion tract, digestional tract. All right, so the physiology of the digestive system. So digestive um, digestion is completed by chemical processes. Enzymes are added to food by the sal saliva glands and the stomach, liver, pancreas, and small intestines. They convert the food to basic sugars, fatty acids, and amino acids. And these basic products of digestion are carried across the wall of the intestines to the liver and processed further and stored or transported to the heart. They are circulated via the blood throughout the body. All right, so moving right along, now we're in the lymphatic system. And this little system is not talked about that much, but it's super important. And the elements of the lymphatic system are the spleen, lymph nodes, lymph, lymph vessels, the thymus gland, and there's also other components, okay? And it supports that circulatory and immune system. So lymph is a thin straw-colored fluid that carries oxygen, nutrients, and hormones to the cells and waste products of metabolism away from the cells to be excreted, all right? So lymph vessels form a network throughout the body that serves as an auxiliary to the circulatory system. And lymph nodes are tiny oval-shaped structures that filter lymph, all right? So they help rid the body of toxins and other harmful materials. Now we have the endocrine system, okay? So the endocrine system um, is a complex message and control system that integrates many body functions. Endocrine glands release hormones directly into the bloodstream, and each endocrine gland produces one or more hormones. So each hormone has a specific effect on an organ or tissue or a process. The brain controls the release of hormones. 
This system is primarily and has a secondary feedback loop to keep the body in balance, okay? Excessive um, or deficiencies in hormones can cause disease processes such as diabetes. And next, we're going to talk about the urinary system, so the anatomy and physiology. So the urinary system controls the discharge of waste materials filtered from the blood by the kidneys. The main functions of this system are to control fluid balance, filter and eliminate waste, and to control the pH. The kidneys are two solid organs. They lie in that retroperitoneal space with the pancreas. They rid the blood of toxic waste products and control the balance of water and salt. The ureters pass um, from each kidney uh, to the drain into the urinary bladder. And the urinary bladder is located immediately behind that pubic symphysis in the pelvic cavity. All right, then you have the genital system. So we're going to move right through. The genital system controls the reproductive processes by which life is created. So the male reproductive system consists of the testes, epididymis, vas differentiae, prostate gland, seminal vessels, and penis. It lies outside the pelvic cavity and except for the prostate gland and the seminal vesicles. Okay. So this figure shows the organs of that male reproductive system. The female reproductive system uh, consists of the ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, and vagina. It's contained entirely within the pelvic cavity, except the clitoris and labia. Okay, and there's uh, on this figure, uh, it shows the organs of the female reproductive system. Okay, so let's talk about the life support chain. And the cells are the fund foundation of the body, and we talked a little bit about that in the beginning. The cells require oxygen, nutrients, and removal of waste. So the respiratory and circulatory um, are the carriers of these supplies. All right, and so if there's any interference, uh, cells become damaged and they die. And so when cells, they use oxygen to take available nutrients, and they turn them into chemical energy. And this is through metabolism, all right? So the ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is used for energy metabolism and storage. This is an aerobic metabolism, and that uses oxygen. When cells switch from a, to an anaerobic metabolism, um, when oxygen is limited. And so what happens in that anaerobic metabolism? Lactic acid is damaging um, waste product of this process. So then you have as lactic acid and other waste accumulate around the cells, the area becomes toxic and eventually the cells can die. Okay, so movement of oxygen and waste and nutrients occurs by diffusion and pH is critical to diffusion. The body expends a large amount of energy to maintain normal pH. So we've talked about the anatomy. Let's talk about the pathophysiology of this a little bit. So in this study of the functional changes that occur when the body reacts to disease, respiratory compromise is the inability of the body to move gas effectively. So this can lead to hypoxia. And what hypoxia is, is a decreased level of oxygen in the body or hypercarbia. And that's elevated levels of carbon in the body. All right, so factors uh, that might impair ventilation. So think about anything that might keep ventilation from happening. And this could be a blocked airway, or maybe the muscles of the breathing are damaged um, by some type of um, neuromuscular disease or trauma, or perhaps the airway is obstructive. So maybe they're having an uh, asthma attack, or maybe it's a drug overdose, or trauma to the chest wall, or an allergic reaction or maybe perhaps some change in atmosphere, or high altitudes, or impaired gas, a uh, uh, pyramid of movement of gas across that cell membrane. And you could also have a ventilation perfusion mismatch. And so what happens is this ratio describes how much gas is moved across effectively through the lungs and how much blood is flowing around the alveoli. And so a mismatch occurs when one of these two variables is abnormal. So let's say there's a pulmonary emboli, and that's preventing blood flow, okay? 
And so, or you could have edema, so some fluid inside the alveoli that's keeping oxygen, the oxygen exchange from happening, or when either the um, ventilation or the perfusion is impacted, respiratory compromise can occur. Okay, so respiratory compromise and its effect on the body. Of course, we talked a little bit about that. What's going to happen is oxygen levels throughout the body is going to fall. Carbon dioxide levels are going to rise, and the brain is going to detect an increase in those levels. The body increases the respiratory rate in an attempt to return the carbon dioxide levels to normal. If increased respiratory rate does not occur, or if it's not effective, in returning those carbon dioxide levels to normal, the blood will become more acidotic. So what happens is blood oxygen levels will begin to fail, um, will begin to fall, and this may cause the brain to use further commands to breathe. All right, so then decreased oxygen levels will force cells to move from that anaerobic into that anaerobic, so from, move from an aerobic into the anaerobic metabolism. And what occurs is shock a condition in which organs and tissues receive an inadequate flow of blood and oxygen. Impaired oxygen delivery causes cellular hypoxia, which leads to anaerobic metabolism, and that leads to lactic acid production, and then finally organ dysfunction. Shock is characterized into several types depending on the cause. The effects of shocks on the body can be similar to the effects of respiratory compromise. The level of oxygen supplied to the tissue fails, cell damage in cells get engaged in anaerobic metabolism, and of course we said this re results in lactic acid production. Then you have the bearer receptors, and that detects decreased blood pressure and initiates the release of epi and norepi. The heart rate increases, the heart beats more forcefully, and then blood vessels contract, and interstitial fluid moves into the capillaries. When there is inadequate oxygenation, cells will create energy through the anaerobic metabolism. And we talked a little bit about that, right? And so this can result in metabolic acidosis. It requires energy, more energy than when you're just using glucose or fuel for fuel and decreased ability of the blood to effectively carry oxygen to the cells. There's a decreased functioning of the oxygen within the cell. Brain cells cannot use alternative fuel. So if the supply of available glucose is dramatically decreased, you have brain cells, um, they can damage and die. And so um, you do not want that. So cellular injury up to a point may be repairable if normal tissue perfusion is restored. When irreversible injury occurs, no treatment will help. Okay. All right. So that concludes the lecture for the human body, uh, chapter six. Now we're just going to go through the review questions, see what we learned. All right. When the follow, which of the following is found in that retroperitoneal space? Oh, we know this one, right? So which one do you guys think? I think it's the kidneys. Uh -huh. The kidneys. It's in the retroperitoneal space. Everything else is in that abdominal cavity. All right, so the, cartilagin the cartilaginous tip of that sternum is called, and we think that that is called the xiphoid process, right? The xiphoid process is that lower part of the sternum, and we use that as an indicator for the CPR, right? The xiphoid process. A person with bilateral, both sides, femur fracture has, so what do we think? fractured on both of his or her femurs. B, bilateral. All right. The most prominent landmark on the anterior surface of the neck, and we probably didn't talk about this, but that's going to be the Adam's apple. And the Adam's apple is also called the thyroid cartilage. Okay, so that thyroid cartilage, that is the prominent landmark on the anterior, the front surface of the neck. Right, and insulin is produced in the, where do we think it's produced? We know it's produced in the pancreas. So it's, uh, pancreas is that solid organ and it produces insulin and digestive juices. All right, the blank connects muscle to bone. So how are we gonna remember this? Tendons, muscle to bones are the tendons. Ligaments are bone to bone, okay? 
All right. And the normal resting heart rate is in an adult is, let's see, I think they're going to say it's 60 to 100. Uh -huh. 60 to 100. Anything below that is bradycardia. And that is below 60. Anything above it is tachycardia. So that's above 100. All right. The left atrium of the heart receives, and we know that that's oxygenated blood from the lungs, right? So oxygenated from the lungs, and then it pumps it out to the body. That's that big, huge pump on that left side. All right, left is oxygenated from the lungs. The largest part of the brain is the, so the largest part of the brain is the smallest word, and that's the cerebrum. Right, the three parts, it's divided, cerebrum, brain, stem, and cerebellum. The largest is the cerebrum. Which of the following statements about red blood cells is false? All right, they contain iron, oxygen, they help fight infection, or they give us our color. And we know the fighters are the white blood cells, so we think it's C. Okay, so C the, um, uh, is right, so the white blood cells are the fighters. Okay, well, that concludes the um, questions for Chapter 6, and uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed it.